how are you sleeping when it's always bright? <laughs> you just so, you, so there's light in the room when you sleep. It's no, just like no, naps, no, like a bunch uh, of naps. No, we have curtains. We don't. My first. I don't know if you've watched my first fifty videos, hundred videos. I had like nobody videos. was watching. You watch any videos? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking. Do you, like, sub, do you subscribe to the channel? No, I just watch it on, on like Instagram. Instagram. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Change Your Podcast. Before this episode starts, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel and comment down below who you would like to see us have on the upcoming videos. Today's episode is with Simon Freund. Simon, I know I butchered your name. I'm sorry. Um, Simon came on after winning Ithaca 25k doubles and then also in this episode we recorded this on a Tuesday and Simon ended up winning this tournament too so yeah it was a fun episode we learned a lot hopefully you guys enjoy the video don't forget to like and subscribe all right what's up everybody welcome to the change world podcast uh, today's guest we have Simon Frund there you get it you get it uh, <laughs> Bro, we're moving on. Anyway, thank you, <laughs> Simon. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming on. Good to be here. Glad yeah, to be here. Um, we're in Wesley Chapel. Um, something that we failed to mention on the last episode, but we're at a 25k in Wesley Chapel. Um, what do you think of the tournament here? What's your experience so far at this tournament, Simon? Uh, I like it. It's a nice place. It's a bit of a change up though from going going in the cold in Ithaca. So it's kind of nice to get out to the to the heat a little bit. But it's been kind of windy the last couple of days. And uh, it's not the best setup to, to put up a camera either. So oh, okay. you've if had, that's any complaints, that, that's my complaint for sure. You've had troubles like recording the matches or what? Yeah, it's just like the way it's set up with the, the wind breakers and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's no really good spot to like set up the camera. But I, I have a plan though for tomorrow's match. I might like climb up on the fence and like, put it on top. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how long? Um, <laughs> Gotta get so, the content. <laughs> how, how long have you been doing YouTube the, is live. the YouTube and content <laughs> creation stuff? I think um, two years, but I, I actually, I don't know if, I'm assuming not many people saw it though, but I actually posted some videos like in Egypt, like 2019 even, a few videos here and there, because I was just like trying it out, because I was recording a lot uh, for my coach and stuff, I was sending a lot of things back home, so I just like tried to cut it up and posted a few things like back in 2019 even. Okay. And those were just straight match cut-ups? Yeah, just no like highlights, I okay. think, yeah. It was yeah. just, yeah. But did you have any, um, cause this has been a challenge for us being like, not that we do your c type of content creation is obviously a little bit different. Um, but it took some adjustment for us to, you know, to talk on camera, like to run our own kind of show. And even when we get to tournaments, like we, like people have encouraged us to try and um, like include them kind of in like the match to match day to day kind of thing similar to what you do but maybe not as strict but it's been a challenge for us like it's not that easy for us to do so was it ch was it challenging for you like was it ever um, yeah I mean it's, it's it's super uncomfortable to be in front of the camera for sure and I mean especially when you're doing it on your own like you always kind of feel like an idiot starting <laughs> off but I, I feel like you just have to like push through that you know all the things that I was like reading up on like how to do it and stuff everybody was like just just do it no matter who, how good you are, you're always going to be like shit the first like 50 videos and yeah. then you're not going to be like, I think they actually talked about that there was like a couple levels that yeah, the first 20 videos when you're absolute shit and then like 20 to 50, you're not like completely ashamed of telling somebody that you're posting videos and then after like 50 or something then you can actually like be a little proud of the stuff you're doing because mm -hmm. then you're, I don't know you know somewhat what you're doing, I yeah. guess. So you feel like you've kind of grown into that stage that you are now, like less I, less uncomfortable? It, I think I, it might be up to like 100 or something. I think that quote, I probably missaid it. But um, I feel like I'm starting to get to the point where I kind of know what I'm trying to do. But I still feel like, like, I don't know, it's just so much stuff trying to figure it out, like what's the best approach. Obviously, like tennis is still the main focus. So it's always, you know, how to do it around it. I guess if I was like fully f like focusing on more of the content, I guess might've been easier to like figure out ways, but you know, with tennis, cause that's always the main priority. You know, if you have a tough week, then you're too tired then you don't want to like film around at the venue and stuff like that. So it's yeah. always kind of like, you know, adjusting to, to the situation. Why did you choose to start taking the YouTube thing seriously? Um, I mean, financially for sure. The biggest thing, like I, I had kind of a rough time, uh, 2020 as I'm assuming most people had like with COVID and stuff. And uh, a lot of my savings, I, I, I don't know, just like struggling financially. 
And then in 2021, we started playing a little bit, not doing too well. And I just kind of noticed, you know, talking to sponsors or just trying to find money anywhere. Like my value for a sponsor, you know, is like zero. And, you know, when people talk about they're trying to, you know, make a living as a tennis player, like figure it out on like the lower tiers. It was so much about that it's almost, uh, you almost have to rely on what you call it, like handouts in a way, mm -hmm. almost. Because I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, like, I mean, if a company gives you like, or a private person gives you like five grand or something, it's not like they're expecting to, to get any value from it because, you know, 10 people are watching your match in a futures match. Mm -hmm. So that's where I just kind of landed on that. If I can kind of create my own kind of audience somewhere, then I can actually provide a value to a sponsor when I'm talking to them. Because I, I, I was just so uncomfortable, like having to ask people like, if they want to support my tennis journey because yeah. at least you felt like i'm you know begging for <laughs> for money yeah, it's true so i just wanted to try to have something to come like have something to bring to the table i guess and at what point did it feel like or did it become the, the case where you had value for the for the sponsors to look out for you uh i mean it's probably better to ask the sponsors that but i, I like i mean maybe the after my first year i'll i mean I don't, I don't know. It's hard to say. Like, but like at, at around which, I'd say maybe... Like how many followers and followers, stuff? Followers, subscribers, did you start to actually get more rhythm with the with help or with people investing in your brand, I was, you could say? Um, I don't, it's, it's hard to say, like, an exact number. I'm still trying to figure it out. But okay. I feel like... Uh, I see you're doing I good now, but you, you're rocking the, the Stiga. <laughs> <laughs> you look you're like you're doing okay. No, but I, I mean, I feel like, in, in, like when you're kind of comparing it to your uh, competitors, I guess, like other tennis players, you know, when you get up to like 20,000 and all of a sudden you're, I mean, you're competing with, you know, like top hundred guys, because <laughs> yeah. then, I mean, not too many guys are too active on social media. So I guess in that sense, you can start to actually, you know, bring to the table and say like, Hey, I'm getting this amount of views compared to, you know, some so other So that's guy. what you do. You like leverage kind of, you say this, this is the product that I have. Like this is the, the reach, the, the audience that I have, the amount of views, that are, the eyes that are on me, kind of, and you, that's how, that's what you used to approach. I mean, I'm trying to, like, I, you, you have these, I guess, like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, standards, you know, like if you have X amount of views, you can ask for like X money per thousand views and stuff like that. So, I mean, I have this kind of like a media kit that has all the analytics connected to my YouTube. And that's like the first thing that I sh show to, to brands and stuff us, like bro. that. Yeah, no, I, I guess you guys set up on that for sure. <laughs> We're trying to get involved too. Yeah, but it's tough, you know, like com like communicating with brands because also a thing for me was always like doing these kind of integrations and stuff. I feel like it's always like a fine line, you know, between just trying to do money grabs and also like, you know, really caring about the product. So it was very tricky for me in the beginning because actually I had a big issue with, I was talking to these brands and I was like, I mean, if I want to do something with you, I want to commit to like a year. And every one of them were like, no, we just want to do like a one-time thing. And I was really like, I, I had like nothing. My first, I don't know if you watched my first 50 videos, 100 videos. I had like, I nobody videos, was watching. You don't want any <laughs> <laughs> I think do, you sub, do you subscribe to the channel? No, I just watch it on, on, on Instagram. Instagram. I can't believe you're on this podcast right now. <laughs> I'm you. you want me to be honest or want me to lie? What would we do it? <laughs> <laughs> Convince me. That's crazy. Sell, sell me. <laughs> sell <it. laughs> no, but I don't know. I just feel like it's tricky because you, you kind of like, you want to do it the right way, but then obviously like at the end of the day, I guess you, they also want to have some kind of security. So you do like one or two or three, and if it works well, then maybe you yeah. can extend it to like a year or month or something like that. But just trying to navigate that is, is very tricky. Can you tell sure. us, can you tell us about Stiga, like how that came about and what, what Stiga is, I guess. Like we talked a little bit briefly about it, but for the audience who. No, it's, it's actually uh, kind of goes back, like a good friend of mine, uh, Daniel, and uh, like we played paddle together a while back and he actually is close friends with the guy who's kind of the CEO of uh, Stiga. And uh, I think they had like a little place when they, they kind of mentioned briefly that they wanted to make a push for tennis. And I think he threw my name in there and uh, then he contacted me. And I guess like when you compare me to most other Swedish tennis players, like reach wise, I can probably compete with a lot of them. And then I feel like, I don't know, we had a meeting, we got along well, and uh, I don't know, they wanted to make a push, and I'm really happy, you know, they chose me. I think they're a great company, just really down to earth, kind of like uh, old school. Tennis, like Stiga has been around for like it's 60, 70 years. It's like with a table local tennis. company? Like yeah, like they're in country. Eskilstuna. So it's what? pretty cool, like in, in Sweet How, yeah. You got your map out or what? <laughs> Brother. <laughs> Brother. <laughs> I have to go to Google or? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but it, I don't know. It's a nice like little like Swedish company that's you know been around in table tennis for a long time. Okay. And uh, I don't know. Just got an opportunity to to discuss with them, try out the rackets, and we just landed on just trying to do something together with with tennis. So did you get your rackets like after you? Play tested their racks and stuff. Did you get it customized to your? Yeah, so I mean, did they, they, they actually, do that for you, or did you do it? They made a, a first line of the Stiga Supreme, uh -huh. and I tried that racket for like three months before we decided to like uh, go in together, because at first I wanted to make sure that I, like before I agreed to something, I'm forced to play with the racket, you know, yeah. that I can't play with. Uh, but then I really liked that racket, and that was the only one that they made so far, uh, or they made like three versions of it, like okay. the pro version, like a lightweight, and then like a kids version of it. So which one you use? <laughs> <laughs> no but uh yeah we're looking to make some more rackets like so for the next kind of lines i can be more involved uh yeah. but i'm i'm a big fan of the racket right now i feel like it works very well great quality and i i think that's where they have kind of like a little edge up on new, like being a newcomer into a, such a tough market you know as tennis rackets yeah because they have such an establishment with like good distributors and suppliers in china so are there other players that are going to start using the sticker rackets uh we're working on it i mean we'll see but right now it's still kind of early on um i'm on them about that like they're not available in the states yet they're like just recently got available in the uh, europe so i think right now the main focus you know is getting it out there okay. like when i came into the picture i think they kind of like pushed up the launch like three months early so they were kind of like a little too early maybe coming out with it um but hopefully now when they can start being available in the states they can start focusing on more on you know getting you guys on it <laughs> we'll make some that's a good push something. Steve, you're watching the emails in, uh, the, down below so i mean you guys won a title last week so it must be a decent record at yeah. least you know? oh, for sure I, I probably have a pretty good record with it you're making a, a push in doubles like what's the what's the plan like is is doubles your thing now or still both I mean, I've you were always, like six hundreds in singles, no? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty high. I mean, I've always like I always loved doubles. Sorry. Throw the man off. My bad. No. Uh, Took me off here. Huh? Yeah, doubles, doubles, doubles. <laughs> no, no, but the doubles. Like, I mean, I always love doubles. Like, I think it's so much fun. Like the tactical aspects of it, and obviously, you know me and giving me some shit there about my height and, and <laughs> size. I I have to rely a lot more on like maybe tactical stuff and i kind of like obviously have a better opportunity for that to showcase that in doubles than singles but i've always loved singles and doubles but with my injuries the last two three years it's just naturally kind of like involuntary been that my doubles has has pulled away a little bit yeah. but uh i mean I'm, I'm still trying hard in singles but i'm starting to get to the point obviously like if i can start getting into challenges maybe i start making a decision yeah because i'm not but getting any like, younger yeah I feel, it's true i feel <laughs> like your personality probably is very well suited for doubles too you know like i don't know like kind of free and loose and like well i'm a phone call in the middle of the podcast as well sorry um free and like i don't know like fun you know what i mean who's that i don't know probably my parents or oh, it's my school your school. donations yeah that's asking for donations <laughs> i'm sorry school i don't have uh anything to give right now <laughs> um but yeah so I was saying that I believe that your like personality is is very well suited for double. I'm I'm sure the viewers can see in your videos like how much you enjoy like every video, bro. You're diving around the place like doing some <laughs> crazy shit in every single video. So I appreciate. It. I mean, like one of my biggest things, you know, playing doubles is to to, I mean, really try to to be comfortable out there. You know, just having fun out there. And I feel like you play your best tennis when you're you know comfortable. Yeah. So I think it's very important for me to, to you know try to do my job of you know making sure my my partner is comfortable out there and just having fun. Bro, is your partner comfortable? Every video I see, this man looks so <laughs> uninterested in the camera. He does not want, he doesn't care. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's probably Joe. <laughs> <laughs> They're winning, so it's fun, I guess. <laughs> What's, um... No, I, I call him the, the Iceman. That was his nickname. They were oh, yeah? Swedish League. He's just, he's just so focused. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, every video, Simon's talking to the camera, and he's just walking at the side, just like... Not, not, not on, about he's it. He's on his own program. Yeah, yeah, own program. He's too Hey guys, quick break. Justin here from The Changeover. I'm gonna talk about Pro Stringer. It's a great machine that I use, Jody uses, and a lot of other pros use as well. You can use it at home, on the road, really anywhere there's a tabletop surface. It takes me about 25, 30 minutes to string a racket on this machine. It is easy to travel with, fits in carry-on, suitcase, tennis bag, no issues at TSA. It's a big money saver. And you can save even more when you use our code 
change over to get $100 off the machine. Back to the episode. So you you spoke about having to balance, I guess, the online persona thing with actually focusing on the tennis. Because I remember last week, I think I got home, must have been Friday, like after midnight. And then I landed and he had messaged me back. I sent him a message earlier that day. And he sent me a picture of him like uploading something to YouTube or something. It was like 1 a.m. <laughs> so like, how much time are you spending actually making videos and editing stuff? And like, how are your days set up? Like, if you have a match day, so you finish a match, you want to put a video up before the next match. Like, how much time do you spend doing that? I mean, I actually thought about it like maybe a month or so ago when I was going through with my girlfriend because she was kind of complaining a little bit. I was spending so much time on my computer. <laughs> okay. But I was counting on it. And, like, and, and I kind of landed that I probably spent like 20 plus hours a week like with social media and I don't do different uh, things. So looking at that, it's like a half time, what do you call it? Like a half time job, Yeah, I guess. And the money wise, it's, it's not the best job. Yeah. <laughs> minimum, minimum wage. Yeah. No, but uh, I don't know. It takes a lot of time for sure. And I, I guess that's where it's like a tricky balance. I've been, I kind of mentioned it to you. Like I've been trying to, to outsource things, but I've just kind of landed on that. It almost takes more time, you know, getting other people to, to help you out. Yeah. <laughs> like obviously probably the startup time just, so I just kind of landed on that. I, I just want to grind it and, and do it my own. Um, I'm obviously enjoying it a lot. So like, sure, I'm complaining that it takes a lot of time, but I mean, it's something I really want to spend time and I'm, yeah. I'm learning a lot doing it. Yeah. So Have I you gotten it better at it? Like in terms of like the amount of hours needed to get something done? Like, yeah, are you for more sure. efficient at editing yeah, and this stuff? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like a lot more efficient. Like, I don't know, just the way you cut it up and you kind of learn the, the quickies and stuff like that to get a little faster. But obviously I'm, I'm a huge rookie when it comes to editing <laughs> yeah it's not my my forte at all but i mean it takes a lot of time and it, it's that balance and, and like i mentioned earlier you know tennis is the main priority so then it always comes second and that's kind of what happened you know if you have a long day you're kind of tired you know you want to take a nap after practice or something and then you get up that's late and then, yeah and it has work to do and then that's where it sometimes happens you know like when i had the swedish league in december it's like super hectic i didn't post any videos for like two three weeks and i just kind of took a little vacation there after as well so i mean i guess it's tricky to balance it because you, you always feel like you want to do more but then you also have to be i guess kind to yourself you know do you have a question if it's um affecting the tennis like if the balance is too much um no when you win a 25k I, I mean i, I want to say that it's just like a motivation i mean at the end of the day i know the best thing for my youtube channel is if i became number one in the world you know in tennis so like for me in order to like, I mean, the majority of people are probably not watching my, my videos because of my insane editing skills and stuff. So it's <laughs> like, not the, not the cinematics there, but, uh, I mean, so just focusing on the tennis, you know, and just improving that is always the main priority in order to make good videos. Right. But like so, these things go hand in hand, right? Like the better tennis player you are, the better the, like your audience will be. And then the yeah, more audience sure. you have, it helps your tennis, like in and terms I, of being able to afford it and this sort of stuff. So, yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure you guys can relate, like if you beat, Roger Federer in a practice, you probably wouldn't complain about editing that for four no. hours and yeah. you look good, you know? <laughs> you hurry up. So that's, last week's editing was easy for you, fun. Yeah, exactly. It's just like diving around. Has this video dropped already, last week's one? No, no. Oh, okay. But I actually have like all of them like ready to go. I just need to sit down and like edit them. I'm starting to get a little better at because like I previously I've done it, you know, you, you like film all the footage and then you just put it in like a folder and then you come back to it and you're like, you have no idea what your idea was of the video. But I actually like really made sure the last week that after every day, I kind of like did almost like a diary. Mm -hmm. So I like wrote down my thoughts and everything for every video. So now I have pretty much everything. Like I know exactly how to edit it. So it yeah. should, should hopefully go pretty quickly. So you, go on. I was going to say on one end, it is hard work, but on the road, we have so much downtime. So yeah. it might also be nice just for your sanity to have something to focus on. Like, it's not always like a, a negative I, from where I sit. I don't know. No, for sure. I mean, I, I always need to have something yeah. to do. I, you know, just like laying down, it gets so stressful. Yeah. Like you just, you Did can you easily golf? get stuck, you know, in bed, just watching you, Netflix or something. You played golf today? That's all you wanted no, to? No, I didn't. I wanted to. Why not? It's because of my, my ab. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so the, the physio wasn't too happy about it when I asked him if, it, like, do you, you think that, that works? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not smart. I asked him, what if I play lefty? And he said, no. But so. do you want to talk about that? Kind of let the audience know what's going on? Because, I mean, 
Yeah. Today we're in Wesley Chapel, but by the time this video drops, it's two weeks from now. So yeah. You'll be, yeah, yeah. I'm no, guessing I, back home by then. Right? No, it's it's. I mean, like, I, I've uh, if you just want me to to mention what it is. Sure. I mean, I guess I've had some issues with my my apps, so I kind of pulled my app. I felt it a little bit uh, when I played against Karu actually the video like about two weeks ago. I felt it a little bit. And that was obviously why I, I lost him. Like I couldn't at all play like, <laughs> my, my level. That's the only reason why <laughs> you lost sure. this. <laughs> so, I mean, so obviously I've been very hurt since then. Um, no, but then I don't know this, it kind of like went back and forth a little bit, but then during Ithaca, you know, when it's more hectic with matches and practicing and everything during the day, like it just gradually felt like I was getting worse and worse and worse. And then in the semis and final, it didn't feel great. And then as I got here, you know, I made sure to talk to the physio and everything. And it's like a little tear in my ab. And uh, yeah, so I decided to pull out a singles because obviously singles is, is so much more serving and so yeah. much more demanding on like the body in that way. So I decided to pull out a singles and just focus through doubles this week and then got to go home and just try to take care of it from there. So, you know, you probably have done it before as well. You know, pulling an ab muscle is kind of, it's so annoying because the longer you go with it, the longer the rest is going to be. Mm -hmm. So you can like, you can keep pushing it, but then it's like, yeah. it's going to come back to bite you no matter what. Yeah, I haven't pulled any muscles but i feel like those are the most like they're like very tricky because those are the ones if you play on it it gets worse you know there's some injuries that um, yeah. you can kind of play through the pain and this sort of stuff but that's like and especially if it's serving like it's an ab muscle you're gonna stretch every time to serve talk about the ab muscle though like i actually have my i, I wish i did youtube like in 2019 <laughs> i had some crazy like when i was you know when i got to like my career high like 600 or so in singles i had some tournaments i was playing in pittsburgh Roche, yeah. or, Rochester and Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael Pittsburgh. Owens. Yeah, like AJ was there. And other, he's from there, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. And um, I just remember that week, it was like raining like crazy and on the green clay. And I was playing all these like three and a half hour matches. <laughs> and I couldn't walk straight because my, my stomach was so like, so I was like pushing the ball in, just mm -hmm. ran back and just like grinding really? like a crazy person. <laughs> and, you know, it was like, and I won singles. Uh, or no, I lost finals, singles and doubles. Okay. But the whole week I was playing like, I don't know, five, six hours a day, like on the court and I couldn't walk straight. And it was, you know, it was like one of those weeks, you know, when you kind of get into this like limbo, you're just like, I don't know. It can get crazy the week sometimes. You're just doing like that. And I remember, we, I don't know, we moved indoors the last day because you got pushed. And yeah, that happened to us last year. I yeah. played the finals of doubles on Sunday outdoors until a set and four, maybe four all, five, four, something yeah, like that. Yeah. And then we played the last two games indoors like at <laughs> like 9 p.m on a sunday yeah we might have we might have had something like that too like first set was outdoors and then indoors yeah. but i just remember it was like i don't know after because i played finals of singles and then finals of doubles and then we got home or we won in doubles actually who'd you play in singles kosminov okay alexander kosminov yeah and then we beat him in doubles though so i got a little let's go <laughs> but uh <laughs> shout out to harrison richmond we won the <laughs> title there the lefty yeah yeah okay, you remember yeah, yeah, i remember him, yeah. big bob i think uh, i played him uh Houston, maybe Houston. I think his coach thought I was a hook. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it was one of those, you know, when you finish the final at like 9, 10 p.m., you get back home and you buy like a huge Domino's and you just crush it and get like a beer or something. You're just waiting. You have like a flight to flight home to Sweden at like 6 a.m. in yeah. the morning. <laughs> you know, you're just like, you just want to die, but yeah. still loving it. <laughs> what, um, Okay, so let's get into the first topic. I guess we've covered a few different things already. <laughs> I saw this topic on a on a, another podcast recently. What's the perfect athletic height? So I guess we can talk about the tennis. I mean, you for sure want to be a little shorter than you are uh, to be a little more flexible in the corners and stuff. And so like 5'11", kind of like me. You 5'11", bro? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure about that one. How tall are you? I was six foot. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I don't know. I feel like he's telling the truth. Dude, I, I was shrinking in college. I like mean? my freshman year at LSU, 5'11". Second year, like 5'10 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I was like 5'10". And I think my senior, I think that forced him. I was like, just write 5'11". Just Please. put back. Just put back. <laughs> no, I think... No, the optimal height. Like, I don't know. I know centimeters. I would probably say like 190, I would say. What's 190? You know, six, it's probably like six, three, four, six, three, six, four. I would say 190, 190 something like that. Centimeters and feet. But shit, I, I feel like nowadays, A six, though, three. Yeah, I agree. Like six, two, six, three. I feel like for tennis, because yeah, like yeah. you're tall enough where you will have like a big weapon on serve and maybe like you but, can hit the ball with a lot of power. Yeah. And then 
but also now it's enough to move like, you know nowadays though with like fitness and how much it's advanced i'm just waiting for you know like the lebron james to come play tennis and just you know <laughs> be a freak <laughs> yeah. just i mean just serve from like 10th floor and then run around like a crazy person that's true so, i, I think mean, i mean look at the guy like the taller guys now they're moving well yeah like medvedev is not bad out there I think like guys like okay. Medvedev and like Zverev, these guys for how tall they are, they move very well. Yeah. But I would say like, like what's uh, how tall is Alcaraz? I think six one, six two. Yeah, he's probably one of the best movers now, like Alcaraz. Yeah. So, but yeah, it depends. But I would say around six two, not, six three. But then serving wise, he's yeah not great. True. Or I mean, right? Like making a perfect player would be like, say around six, yeah, six three maybe. Yeah. But it all depends. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll take a couple more inches if I could. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Um, next topic is, so we talked a little bit about um, the, like how rewarding it was for you to play last week. So for the viewers who don't know, they recently changed the, the points, like in challenges, like I think they reduced the points. If you win it, it's the same. But if the, all the other rounds, they reduce the points. And they round. increase points at ATP. Yeah, and they increase yeah. ATP. So yeah. Simon was saying that his plan was not to play these 225s. He was supposed to play the 50Ks in New mm -hmm. Wells. But then it was probably, unless he won in New Wells, the first week is more rewarding to play um, Ithaca last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I mean, with the whole point structure, I think it's so, like, they make it so tough to jump levels, you know, like the difference between like going from futures to challengers and going from challengers to ATP is just like a crazy jump. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like maybe it has to be that way, but like you're talking about like winning a challenger and then going to second place that it's like half the points. Yeah. It's like, it's crazy. It's crazy difference. Like in, in <laughs> any Wells, you would have had to make final to have this finals of a 50K now is what? Yeah. 20 points. 25. 25. They, they cut so, it in half, yeah. So, and the teams that, like you were going to be one of the last teams in. Yeah. So you'd have to make finals in a tournament that you're one of the last teams in. Yeah. Versus and instead with the first seeds. Yeah. You first know, seeds. Yeah. Easy final last week, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gee. <laughs> no, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like I heard that they were saying that they were trying to not like force guys to not play down as much because it's too easy for guys to play down. Like if you have a higher ranking to play up as much as you can. Yeah. But I feel like it's just done the opposite. Like it's so much yeah, more yeah. worth it now for good players to play down because why would you as a doubles team play in your wells and have to beat a bunch of really strong teams when yeah. you can be seated after 25 and maybe have an easier way to get the same amount of points. You know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, to me, I don't understand why they make it so complicated. Like I, I feel like you just have like a normal ladder and just like just increase my yeah. it's just the same the whole way through mm -hmm. you know so yeah. it's just like a red line in it yeah i don't know i don't, I don't know the reason why either, but but hopefully i don't know if there's some way for them to fix it but i don't know they change this stuff all the time yeah. sorry but we're uh in the airbnb with a bunch of other people so if there's background noise forgive us <laughs> you know reese was saying to us that like when i i called him to do this setup reese is who edits all our videos and I was saying to him, like, I was worrying about the light coming in and I was worried about, like, the, the angle and the sound and all this stuff. And he said, like, part of what makes us, uh, like, like, what we're doing is that we're on the road. Like, it's not going to be perfect. Like, sometimes the sound is going to be off. It's authentic. Be off. Yeah, it's authentic. It's we're shitty. actually on the road. shitty? <laughs> <laughs> you know, was, was that growing up in, in Sweden and living through the, the winter, how did you survive, like, Living in darkness. <laughs> Make it That's sound cool. Really, this is That's sound horrible. <laughs> yeah. That's living in but darkness. But before we go outside. there, I just wanted to say though, like when, when you talk about that with the podcast, like I actually think about that a lot. Like, uh, like when I'm editing my videos, when I'm like doing these cuts and I'm like just looking at it, I'm like, like this is so bad editing. But then I'm like, well, who am I trying to kid? Like yeah. I'm shit at this. Like <laughs> it's probably making it more authentic. Yeah, you know, it's, true. it's shitty. But uh, no, <laughs> we're going to Sweden. Like. I think, I guess when you grow up in it, you don't really think about it much. Mm -hmm. But then once you experience not darkness over the winter, yeah. then you <laughs> understand how bad it is. But then obviously like the past couple of years of my life, I, I'll spend most winters like in the States or something like that. Okay. So I've tried to get away from it, but 
I mean, it's very tricky. I think in November we had like four hours of sunlight the whole November or something That's like that. Crazy. That's crazy. What? So there's a lot like you have to take like D vitamins and stuff like that just to, I don't know. I so it's depression. literally nighttime for most of the day, like almost all. Yeah, the day. yeah. I mean, there's like barely any sunlight. But they so have the kids go up. to school and yeah, yeah. Dude, my girlfriend, <laughs> she went to she went to school up north in Sweden, and there it's like insane. Like you have like no sunlight, and there they have like everybody's mandatory uh, like uh, D vitamin pills and stuff like that because like the depression rates and stuff is no is way. too high. It's crazy. It's like that. So you just played all indoor tennis, like. Well, during the winter, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, summer to bring it back though, like summer in Sweden is a joke. It's always sunny. It's unreal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, like, like, like being like when you're young and have a lot of energy, like Swedish summer is insane. Like you know, you as a typical day, I could get up at like five a.m. I go play golf. Like you could oh, start playing know. golf at like five thirty. Typical day start about five a.m. That's like, ridiculous. I mean, ridiculous. But it's huh? always sunny. You don't well, five a.m. But can you feel the time of the day? You, you know what you, I mean. You know, but like, you lose when, it. You know when the sun is up you're so much more awake, right? Yeah. And, but, and that's the difference, you know, like in the winter when the sun is, like when it's dark, you're tired all the time. So right. it's like, you have so, the complete opposite. So a typical day in the summer, 5 a.m. You wake up at 5 a.m., you're playing golf. At yeah, I go play golf like two hours. So I play golf like six to eight. Okay. And then I go play tennis like nine to 11. And then you have lunch and then you play tennis again, like two to four. And then I would go, you know, play like soccer or Bro, golf or something in the and, there's a, and there's a bunny over and then we go play like, but we always almost finished like during the summers i almost always finish with golfs in the evening with my friends and we could like go out there at 10 o'clock and we can finish at like 1 a.m and it's still sunny. you sleep for four hours and then do it again i don't know you have so much energy in the summer it's insane. that's ridiculous you have that time but that's where you go you gotta be or? smart though you gotta like you gotta put the golfs in the morning and in the evenings so like you can kind of like be a little tired so you it's fine you have like blackout curtains to sleep. Like, how are you sleeping when it's always bright? <laughs> you just so, you, so there's light in the room when you sleep. No, it's like no, naps, no, like a bunch have, of naps. No, we have curtains, in Sweden. Um. So you play your junior career, and then the first school you went to was LSU. Yeah. So yeah. You are recruited to play there. You played what three years there? Yeah. How was oh, two that? years, two years, two years. Two years. So you played two years there, two years at UCSB. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What was the reason for, I guess, choosing LSU and then unchoosing LSU? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, like choosing LSU, uh, during my junior career, it was kind of weird. Like, I didn't play many junior tournaments. And, like, financially, it was a little tricky as well. And then I actually had a guy that, that came and funded me for a summer. So he gave me enough money so I could go play uh, tournaments in the summer. And this is actually a little like thing that's still on the internet. Like I actually blogged it. Like me and my friend, I did like a blog in mm -hmm. Swedish when we were traveling around when we were like 16 or something around Europe. And I actually did really well in like four or five tournaments. I won like two or three of those. And I don't know, so I kind of quickly got up my ranking. And then all of a sudden, like very quickly, I started getting all these like recruiting messages from everybody. And I had no clue what I was doing. I was just, you know, trying to figure something. I had no clue what school what this was and that and mm -hmm. whatever. But I kind of landed in, like, I picked out three schools. So it was kind of in between, like, LSU, Cornell, and uh, Notre Dame was my, like, top three picks. Though very different schools, but, like, I don't know. And I actually just went on a visit at LSU. And I got along really well with the team and the coaches and everything. And I just kind of landed on it. But, like, in hindsight, I still probably would have picked at LSU. But it was, like, you know, come from Sweden, you go to to the US and you have all these like massive football stadiums. I always came on a recruiting trip like during a football game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just get blown away, you know, having like 100,000 people screaming, like you walk on the field before the match, yeah. you know, like you just kind of get blown away like how big everything is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, decided on LSU. Had a great time there. Uh, teammates and everything. I don't know, I had just a really good time there. And uh, it's, I want to say that I kind of like experienced the, the best of two worlds in college. You guys, like, I mean, obviously you guys with your experience going to college too, but like when I was at LSU, I had, a, you know, such a big sports school with like the football, the basketball and baseball, like all top athletes were there. We had like Ben Simmons, you know, basketball mm -hmm. player. Yeah. So he was there one year when I was a sophomore and then, you know, he was number one pick in the draft the next year. And, uh, but like academically, it wasn't the biggest priority, you know, like, I mean, 
I don't think it's what a secret. What was your major there? Uh, I, I jumped through everything. I did like when I came in, I did psychology, and then I switched to uh, statistics my second year, and then I transferred um, to statistics. Yeah, I tried a little bit, but I mean, I said, <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't major in it though. So I, I okay, made, I bailed out. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yo, Chaps making a cameo. <laughs> that was funny. So, sorry, no. go on about the, the transfer. So, you experienced best of both worlds. So Yeah, so, I mean, LSU, I don't think it's a secret that, like, the, the academic or the athletics department is probably, like, more ready to, to fire a professor than to, like, fail a, a big football player because they're just worth so much money, you mm -hmm. know, like, so it's just such a big priority. But then after, when I decided to transfer, it's, it's too long of a story, but, like, I don't know, there's just some different things happening there with the program overall. Uh, like the head coach ended up leaving the year after and like four of my best friends were, were like graduating and I just kind of wanted to focus a little bit more on academics as well and tennis wise I wasn't doing the best so I just kind of wanted to just I don't know just start over with a clean slate and uh, I don't know I had a great time there though with like the teammates the, the coaches and everything but when I transferred my more priority was more of like a location because like LSU <laughs> and like Baton Rouge so it was kind of like in the middle of nowhere and the college is like everything right so it's like it's super cool in a way that like no matter where you go they all kind of recognize you as like lsu athletes but then like when i transferred i really wanted to go to the west coast i wanted to be like on the beach mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, wanted to focus on more like an academic school and then ucsb was the the top priority and managed to work it out so so what did you study there so i came in and i tried to do a statistics I, and the close thing they had was like financial math mathematical and the statistical analysis <laughs> so I did that for like a year a genius, but then uh, I don't know I, we're running out a lot of different things there but you know how in college a lot of the the big schools they can kind of offer you a fifth year if you want to finish your studies yeah. so they can kind of pay for your fifth year yeah even though you're not like playing tennis anymore they can pay for it so they had that at LSU and I kind of assumed that it would be the same thing at UCSB so I tried to do that and I, and I was like a half a year or a year behind because of the transfer like all credits didn't transfer and uh, as I started my senior year, I told them like, yeah, so I'm planning on doing like the fifth year and stuff like that. And my coaches pretty much just like laughed at me. They're like, bro, we don't have any money. Like you're gonna have to pay, you're, you're gonna pay, you're gonna pay for the fifth year yourself. And I was like, yeah, kind of panicking about it because I was so far behind. So I ended up changing my major to global studies. And then my whole senior year I actually did like, like the max course load. I did, I don't know. I did like 26 credits or something. Or, I don't know. Per semester? Yeah. What I, I think it's 15. Yeah. Right? 15 is normal. Yeah. And we had quarter systems. So we had like three yeah, quarters. Oh, so okay. every quarter I, I did like 24, I think 24, yeah. So. Wow. So the first week of classes, I remember I had to run to every professor and like just ask them not to drop me because I had all my classes overlapped because I had too many, you know, like in the yeah. schedule. Mm -hmm. So I took all the classes that you only had to go, like you had no attendance grade. So you only had to come for like the, the midterm and the final and maybe like some. So if you did all that, when do you have time to actually enjoy school like you wanted to, like the location and? I mean, it's weird. Dude, looking, you get good grades or what? Dude, looking back at my senior year, I have no clue how I, how it worked out. <laughs> like, like, I mean, I guess I can come clean with it now, but like literally. Cheating. <laughs> Cheating. <laughs> no, no, no. no. This degree you. is fake. Dude, uh, maybe maybe this is from Sweden, you know, having that kind of time schedule, like getting up early and then not sleeping that much. But like in college, I, like a typical day in college, I literally get up early and we had like morning workout or, or something, weights, practice. And then, you know, at nine or 10 o'clock, you go to, uh, you know, go to practice or go to classes. But because I had classes that had no attendance, I, it wasn't like mandatory for me. And I got really close with our volunteer coach. Shout out to, to Crosby, if he's watching this. And he was a member at like a, a really nice country club. And dude, we played golf like every day between like- Bro, what? We played golf like between like 10 and two every day. And then I'd go to, you know, tennis practice at like three or four o'clock. And tennis practice like, I don't know, three to six. And then as soon as we got home, we went out and surfed until sunset, like 7.30 p.m. And what then, drugs are you on? That's what I want to know. <laughs> because like, I, I don't know how we got together, but somehow, and, and I had a girlfriend too, somehow. So how did you f pass school? I don't know. I, I, like, I went to, I remember I always went to the, the library at like midnight. And like, I don't know. 
It had to You're stay lying, there. bro. You no, didn't I, do all of this. It was weird. You did not do all of this. Are you a scratch golfer? You have to be a scratch golfer by now. No. Now what I mean? I'll drop now. Playing I mean, I, when I was all in the these States, hours in Sweden, all these hours in when school, I was you in, play more golf than tennis. When I was in the States, I was around a scratch golfer. Like that year, I was playing so much. Some yeah. of my best friends were on the golf team too. So we I played, played golf. You remember you and I played golf in went to the driving range that year that we played the Calabasas double tournament. Uh, I'm trying to think. Of we played Arcadia, the oh, yeah, 15. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then we took the car, your I guess your car, to Calabasas. We played. <laughs> The wildcard tournament. We just hit some golf balls? Yeah, we just went to the driving range. You gave me a lesson for the driving range. I didn't realize at this point you're like a professional golfer. <laughs> so he's very good at golf. Yeah. The the run, decent. The like, I've dropped. Like, I haven't played much the last couple of like, decent. last years. But I just want to understand the energy, bro. How do you mean you wake up for weights, tennis, yeah. golf for four hours, eat tennis again, and then go surf? I don't know how I get I actually Daily. Know. That's what he said, surf, as in surf waves. You deaf? I thought he meant serve tennis balls, like another practice. Oh. <laughs> no, <laughs> he meant in the water. <laughs> no, he went surfing. In the ocean. And we then lived, at night, we lived, chill like, with right, his girlfriend. We had like two minutes Crazy, down to the beach. Bro. So we went out there. And I, I'm not you the best. You said is nice, huh? Yeah, I'm not the best surfer though, but like, you know, so majority of the time I was just laying there on my board. <laughs> and okay, kind of like squawking around a little bit, trying to catch that wave here and there. But it was just so nice doing it. But some, I, I don't really know, like, just once a week, I'll just grind it out during the night. Study. Yeah, and just push through it. And I said once a week. Man had seven classes. No, but somehow we just, I don't know. I got, I got pretty good grades that year, and I, I don't know, survived it. So I managed to graduate, like, on time. Again. <laughs> sound like it sounded like it was worth it for you. No, so wait, when time. we played that year, you were just you were done school then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But the UCS, UCSB team was good. Like, Alvaro was on your team, no? Yeah, yeah. So you guys were ranked or what? Did yeah, we, we were, like... 30 i think okay the year before we were like 24 i think something like that so and then around 30 maybe 30 40s yeah you said you were focused on academics so was pro tennis still on your mind when you went to ucsb or was it more just enjoy the rest of your time in college and see what's after after school it was like a 50 50. okay i actually like after i graduated i didn't touch a tennis racket for <coughs> four months six months maybe even and uh yeah. What made you want to go and try again? Or pick I, actually, up? I actually went into paddle a little bit. I was involved in paddle during that time. And like, I enjoyed it, like playing paddle and stuff. But then not to give shit to paddle too much, but I, I just kind of felt that like I, I still f had more to give as mm -hmm. an athlete. And I just felt like tennis was just like- What do you mean, paddle's bigger not athletic? No, no, paddle's tough, but I just felt like as a sport overall- For your height though, paddle sport. might be like- <laughs> <laughs> Simon, what are your thoughts on pickleball? It's tricky. Are you trying to go viral over? <laughs> no, but no, not not to like you know to, don't edit this like bad. <laughs> no, but paddle paddle is great, but I just felt like as a like a professional player, I just feel like the tennis tour is so much more established than a pro paddle tour, and I just I don't know, I just wanted to make a push, and then obviously playing tennis my whole life, I just didn't feel like I was I was done with it. Okay, so. Yeah, the um just started off again. First tournaments in Dominican Republic. Dominican. It's, it's oh, I was there. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. you played AJ in one of them. Yeah, yeah. I had a crazy match against you know Jose Pereira. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was, that was huge. Like I wanted that to get a point so I could play. I like that, I think. yeah, it's, when they changed the system, I probably wouldn't have been able to play the next year. Yeah, I didn't get that. But uh, oh, it was crazy times. So. When um when you made the serve up. Yeah, uh, the pancake sir. Justin wrote it down wrong. See the man changed it to f all caps. The pancake. What sir. did I call it? The inside out serve. Inside out. Disrespect. Reverse. Serve. Whatever you want to call it. So when <laughs> when you hit this serve, you just like yeah. messing around one day and then. How did it start? Just, what do you think I'm doing here? Not asking that question. Just get to it. How did it start? <laughs> like, like so. Actually, when I was like 12, I played a junior tournament and we played on carpet indoors. And I remember everybody talked about, you know, slicing on carpet is super effective and slice serving. And I just remember I played someone and then on the ad side, I never tried it before. And the first time I did it was in a match. I was like, let me just try to do a slice serve the opposite way. And I remember I hit an ace with it. The first time I ever- tried things is what I'm I swear, <laughs> I swear, like, part of <laughs> No, but the first time I hit it, ten. I remember I hit an ace with it when I was like 12, but then somehow I just kind of forgot about it. Mm -hmm. But then it came back like two, three years ago when I was working with my coach, to help me figure out how to serve finally in my life. So I haven't figured out. 
but uh, <laughs> but uh, he was really on me about learning how to kick serve, and you know I was trying to kick serve into the side. Uh, what do you call it? Like side wall. Side. Side. You know, you like so it bounces into the side. Uh, yeah, we can talk net. later. I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> 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 no, but I, I just kind of came out because I was just trying to be a, a smart ass against my coach because okay. I just kept on trying to kick and I couldn't make it. And I was like, I was like, screw you. I mean, I can just do this. Like I can make it if I want to. And I yeah. just did that and I started making it every time. And he like was trying to, to argue with me, but then I kept making it every time. So he was like, didn't really know what to do. <laughs> so he uses this serve in real matches. Yeah, yeah a lot. A good amount. Really? What about the kick? Use that one in real matches? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, know. don't have that one. <laughs> it's, not, it's not an arsenal, man. <laughs> do people panic? Yeah. For sure. I mean, it's different. Like, so everybody's different with it. Like, I would crush Justin with it, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> do you do it on deuce side too or just outside? You can do it on the deuce, but it's so much easier for people to read it on the deuce. I don't know why, but I just, like, you can kind of feel when you hit it that people just kind of they sense know. it a like, easier. Because, like, the way you swing at it, I guess mm -hmm. it comes off the same way. But on the ad side, the main thing about it is the way I, I accelerate and, and swing towards the ball, like, accelerate through it, is exactly the same way as if I had a T-serve. It's just that I switched the grip, right? So like a lot of people, after I do it once, it looks the same, but it goes T and it looks the same and it goes. So like, so they just start to like miss step a little bit. Yeah. So they kind of lose that like first step. So I've just noticed that even though I might not use it all the time to hit the pancake serve, if I just use it like once or twice, then I get so much more of my T serve too. Even like, if you miss it, right? Yeah, yeah you know, for sure. So like, so it doesn't really matter if I make it or miss it, but. I mean, percentage wise, I make it for sure, like 60, 70% if I want to. Yeah. But then I can always like go for it a little bit more. And then, cause it's kind of wild with the spin. Were you ever like ashamed or you know, this is the guy that does that serve? Like he's the one with this, you know? No, I think, I think it's funny. I mean, I, like to me, the most important thing is, you know, just trying to, to figure things out your own way, like, and just find solutions to it. And I don't think there's really like a right or wrong to how to do it. You know, like if you want to serve out wide, like you serve it out wide. And how you want to get it there like if you have a big kick like that guy if you have like a <laughs> underhand serve or something like that as long as it gets the job done yeah i just think it's all about just finding your own way there sure. do you ever go flat wide like regular yeah yeah so i mix it in so that's what like i do against a lot of people you know like sometimes i go slice out wide so then it curves mm -hmm. the you other watch way. any of his point play videos so then it's like but i've seen the the serve on on ig i've seen it I've seen it, but he I'm has, just shocked that a YouTube channel. Brother. I'm going to subscribe right now because this is a little awkward, actually. <laughs> he's, coming, a hater. he's coming on my channel as a favor and yeah. I'm not even subscribed to his. a hater, bro. I got you, bro. What's, no, the, bro. what's the name again? What's Simon the last name? <laughs> Simon Foon. <laughs> Foon. This guy, the guy comes up quick on my thing, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's going to be tough. He's bro. in the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. 30.5k <laughs> subscribers, bro. 35. Yo, that's doing it. <laughs> Uh, no, so, but, it, but it's funny, but with the serve though, it's very different compared to who you play against. Because like, you know, some people that are very comfortable on the backhand side, that are like loose with the backhand, it doesn't work as well. But people that are more like a little stiffer on the backhand side, they always like rush to it a little mm -hmm. bit more. But if you're like loose with it, so you can kind of like wait for it to come into you, then people can handle it pretty well. But if they're stiff with it, you know, they always like kind of like panic, stick it out and go cross with it. So then it's very easy for me to like, you know, build a point. I'll go that one and I'll kind of sprint in or get a forehand or yeah. come into the net a lot of times. So it's just Effective. all about finding the right yeah. moment for it, I guess. True. What's so much is confidence too, though. Huh? You know, like when you're feeling it or if you're not feeling it, like confidence. Like if you're not feeling it, you're, you don't hit it as much? Yeah, like it depends like how, how loose you feel. Like, I don't know if you can get up there and extend it because like you have to release it. It's like a, it's like a slice serve, you know, but with extra slice in a way so if you get like a little tense then it just it doesn't come down it go, like you know, so you have to like yeah know. do you you ever have any hot like bad blood with anybody after you release like the clips so like sometimes you release clips and maybe like it's a little embarrassing like the way they lose a point or whatever anybody I, ever give like a i don't think i mean like for me i feel like it's very important not to like embarrass somebody uh -huh. i mean like I, I feel like the only times i like give someone shit is when I know the guy very well. Okay. So I know, I mean, I would never, you know, if I'm playing some random guy that I don't really know, you know, like mm. zoom in on him and like, yeah, you know, okay. so like <laughs> do um, some editing. So yeah, I mean, like, I, I think it's very important for me to just try to be as respectful as possible. 
I mean, I always, I, it's very easy, you know, to give myself shit because I, I find it fun to like, you know, yeah. mess mm -hmm. around with my vid, like what I'm doing. But, you know, against other people, I guess it's also like how you take it, you know, like an underhand serve. Some people can react to it as it's like super disrespectful. But then if you're, I mean, it all comes down to like why you're doing it. If you're actually doing it to be disrespectful, then obviously maybe it's disrespectful. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing it, you know, as a legit. The, play, the intention matters. Yeah. Yes, there's intention behind it. And I feel like, you know, if I'm in the right with it, then it usually works out yeah. pretty well. You know? How's it been like, um, like, I don't know, as you become this thing, because I was in Hungary. This thing. Early this, this like, this like, <laughs> Yeah. You're Simon, the guy with the channel, the guy with the serve, you know, because yeah. like I was in Hungary and I was warming up with this guy and this man just hit, the, hit your serve. Yeah. And he was like, do you know Simon? Like, do you random German person? I never met him. He never met me. He had no idea that I would know you. And he was like, this is Simon's serve. And he was hitting the serve, you know, and I was like, <laughs> so you've become like a, like a thing. Like you've become the person that has the serve. Like, I love have that. people ask you, like, come up to you and ask you like a bunch of questions and stuff like yeah i mean it's happened for sure and I, like nothing makes me happier you know when i get i get tagged and there's some kid that's like hitting the pancake serve or something like that <laughs> some coaches might be like a little little mad or something mm -hmm. but i just think it's so much fun you know when, when kids are hitting it and they're like you know they send me a message like hey i just hit my first pancake serve and, and they're obviously like super pumped about it yeah. to me it's just like i mean they're they're just having fun with tennis and just trying out new things and just exploring it. It's good to have your so own little stamp on tennis too, though. That's what I'm yeah. saying. You know, the tennis world knows about your thing. The man was really literally cool. like, this is, this is, you know, Simon, this is Simon serve. Really. Simon. He didn't, <laughs> like, right-handed serve, slice out wide over the fence, like over the short you fence. You good? Outside. Yeah, you did pretty good. You did pretty good. It was pretty fun. You know, like, uh, TFO actually came up and asked me about it, like, in Stockholm Open a few years back. And uh, yeah, he asked me, like, how I did it and stuff like that. Because uh, Taylor Fritz, I don't know if you've seen it, he does that too. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen that. But he yeah. doesn't switch the grip like in the in the toss. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of switch my grip like like right before I accelerate. But he, you know, switches it before and then goes. So during Stockholm Open, which is like in October, November, I was talking to Francis about it and I was showing him how I did it and stuff. And we we're talking about it and he was like giving Taylor some Fritz about it, like some shit about it and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks or two months later, they played the United Cup. And... Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this clip, maybe, but Taylor did it in like, a, I don't know, one of the matches. I did see that. Yeah. And he missed it by like, uh -huh. like super far. And Francis was just cracking up on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Do you I get to play that tournament every year, Stockholm Open? Because I know you played, you played doubles last year, right? Yeah, I played it um, two other last three years. Okay. This was year, last I, year when you played with Leo Borg, was it? Yeah, yeah. Last year too. Yeah. yeah. So, I, or no, this year I didn't play it. But okay. the year before, I think I played with Leo. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's really cool playing with him. We played Swedish Open last year too, which was awesome. And uh, before that, I played the Stockholm Open with Nino Serdarusic. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. We got in as alternate. But, uh, oh, you got directly in? Yeah, as alternate, okay. so, like on site. Nice. Really cool. But awesome. Cool Different experience. lifestyle playing those tournaments than. Yeah, it's than you, and I, I think also the, the Swedish ATP, I think they won a lot of you awards as like the best ones. Sorry? Put up your camera at the ATP matches. Or? <laughs> <laughs> Any different pressure to do it there? I kind of sneak it. You know, it's a little. You easy. did. Yeah, I put it up there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, watch out here. Yeah, I mean, I'll, probably get, I'll probably get sued like ATP. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no. I mean, no. But it's, it's a cool experience, and I, I think also the the two fifties in Sweden. I think they've been ranked, you know, as the best like two fifties. So I think my experience of the 250s is a little like blown out of proportion, mm -hmm. but obviously like all the ATP tournaments is super nice yeah. compared to <laughs> the stuff. Yeah, yeah, future. Future. <laughs> no, but it's cool for sure. Let's, um, let's get into some fan questions. So the first one is from Maxime. Can you discuss the difference between European coaching and North American coaching? Um, they, he asked this question of like maybe First, when we announced that we we're going to have Karu and Simon on, okay. I figured it would be better for you to describe it since you've kind of experienced like training at home. And I'm sure you played in a bunch of yeah. the European countries compared to how it was like in the college system and stuff like that. Um, well, my only experience like with an American coach, you know, is from college, obviously. Um, but I think the main difference that I've just noticed in my experience is that like in Europe, they're so, very technique centered, I want to say. Maybe it's the same in the US, but I, I just feel like in Europe, like my experience is that the coaches are very technical oriented. 
where in the states i feel like it's more about you know like competing especially in college it's so much more focused about like all right this is what you have like you know we just try to make the best out of it and i think you know like the optimal thing is to find some kind of like in between obviously because I, I i've noticed a couple of times in sweden especially like the coaches are too focused on you know like the, the, the <clears throat> technique has to be perfect and i think like in overall like european players maybe or especially scandinavian have like very good technique but then when it comes to like competing and just being like tough out there and, and stuff like that, they probably fall short to most like American players, I want to say. But like also, I feel like your experience was in the US was in the college system where yeah, they so need yeah, results yeah. right now. Yeah, know? that's true. So, yeah, I so that's what I mean. So experience would I have different yeah. if you had like an academy or something. I don't know. I'm not saying. No, I, and I haven't that. been. So it's, that's, that's what I mean. Like so my experience is obviously very limited because yeah. I've only experienced like college tennis when i'm more grown up so it's like when you're 17 maybe you're not gonna yeah. go in there and like poke in your technique too much but you you also had some experience because you trained from what 13 yeah. 15 15 but the coach that i had when i was in europe was the same coach i had when i was in florida at the academy so i don't i don't know for example like we know beggy he's european um but i wouldn't say I would just say it just is like a it's just culturally it's just different I guess I think a lot of coaching has to also do with um, getting along with someone and understanding what makes them tick and how to I guess maximize what they have. Yeah. So I feel like I've gotten along well with European coaches. I've gotten along well, maybe less so, <laughs> but with American coaches. But I had, for example, with Taylor Dent, we got along very well. Um, so I just think it ends up being kind of what what suits you sometimes, because like if you if you can't connect with the coach on a personal level, then it's gonna be hard for you to take in anything he's talking about when it comes to tennis either. Yeah. So I think it's the differences are definitely primarily for me, um, yeah, cultural and social. Yeah. And then you kind of go from there. Yeah. But when it comes to ideas about tennis, I just think. You probably you find good coaches in Europe and good coaches in the US and bad coaches in Europe, bad coaches in the US. So like, I think it's I think more sure. about the person to person. Like the trust is for sure the most important yeah. thing. You know, like yeah. if you really trust the coach, if, even if he says something that's not perfect, yeah. it's still probably gonna be better than you know for something sure. else. That's why also college tennis is so much different because it's such a business with college tennis where yeah. these coaches need results or they'll get fired by the school. Yeah, you know what I mean. So like, they. They don't care what they'll do. They need the result. You know, they don't like this. These players are going to be here for four to five years and then they're gone. Yeah. They want to stay, you know, yeah. I've also so seen, selfishly, they I've need seen to coaches improve. have players with like small injuries and played them, played them, played them until the guy couldn't play tennis anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's oh, just different. You talk about college and then a, like a professional coach, like, I don't know. I don't know what your experience was on the court with. Uh, was it Brian Garber? He's uh, yeah, Ethan, Ethan and, and Kovas coach. I'm mm -hmm. sure. I don't know if that's similar to being around Beggy. I don't know, but he's also he's American. I don't know if. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know that much about his coaching style, but I know he's extremely um, personable. Right? Mm -hmm. Like what you were saying, like the relationship that we have with Chris is kind of him. the relationship that it like, seems from this. I've only practiced with them three times, but. Um, the relationship that they have with that he has with his players like Kova and, and Ethan. So like, yeah, I don't know about the actual. And maybe the equivalent would be like, what's the coach like in the Swedish league? Like, is yeah, yeah. is how is that compared to the college coach? Well, he actually he went to college. Like, he went to Ole Miss. Okay. And he's um. Well, I, I think the biggest thing that you guys mentioned is the fact that like when you're in college you only have like four years mm -hmm. so it's more stressful the way coaching is and the way it works but like you have more of a chance to build a, a stronger relationship maybe with the coach back home you know that you kind of at least have the idea that you're going to be together you know for 20 years forward like you mm -hmm. can at least think about that yeah so i think that's where like the, the coach in at leading my my swedish club does very well is that he really makes it feel like this is a family like we're going to be together until we're 80 years old yeah which is something that might be tough to replicate, like in college, as no matter how hard you try. You know? Do a lot of people watch the matches? 
Yeah, we did a great, like, I, I mean, all, all credit to leading. I think they did a great job just making an event there. And we had the playoffs at, at the club. So we managed to, you know, pack the, the stands and everything nice. there. So it was really cool. And, you know, being a small little club, like just having, I think it was maybe like three, 400 people. Just having that around the court, like you, you know, it's all you need, you know, to really feel like great energy in there. Yeah. So do a very good job there. It's just, I think that's where, you know, you can find some kind of middle ground because college tennis does a very good job of maybe trying to make like a team and like that mm -hmm. aspect of it, which we lack in a lot of other spots. But uh, that's where like at leading at it, trying to do the similar thing. Cause a lot of guys on our team have the college experience and the coach especially. So he's kind of like taking a lot of the, the things that he's learned from there and trying to bring that into the more local, like, yeah, yeah, that that's environment. Cool. It's cool, for sure. Um, next question is from Jonathan. If you were king for a day, what change or changes would you make on the ITF circuit and why? I, had, I should have wrote down the answers I had for you before. But, you wrote uh, it down? No, I forgot about it. But uh, well, one thing, I don't know if this is necessarily to the circuit, and I think the PTPA actually posted something about it like today, but the fact that they just don't have a set like a partner or something with like airlines or with, you know, hotel chains and stuff like that, just to simplify it. Cause I mean, I, like from being in the environment that we were like, we're moving into a little bit more, you know, with like social media and like partnerships and like sponsorships and stuff like that. You know, if I was, uh, well now I'm just gonna say Hilton cause that's who partnered with P2P. I don't yeah. know exactly to what extension it is, but let's say if I was like Hilton, obviously like partnering up with the ATP or partnering up with ITF, you know, having so many players traveling around and like being involved in tennis, like it's such a great opportunity to like be a part and supporting, I don't know, professional athletes. Yeah. Just the fact that they haven't been able to just have that. I think that's crazy the biggest to thing, like accommodation is, I mean. Yeah, just having like, cause it's a win-win scenario. And like, obviously, I don't think there's a secret that a lot of places where they have tournaments is where you know, it's not the, the top time for like resorts to have <clears throat> tourists. So they're making money obviously from our tennis players being there. Yeah. So it's like a source of income. And then I feel like we could just make it into win-win. So like maybe we get a better deal, but they're still making more than not than having anything. Yeah, exactly. And then like, and then obviously somewhere like ITF has to kind of regulate it a little bit. Like they have to be in charge of mm -hmm. establishing that partnership. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what the deal that the PTPA has with Hilton or how that works. Cause yeah, at, I don't know, yeah. like at the top level, don't a lot of the the tournaments have accommodation like at the at the ATP and slams and this stuff. Yeah, you have always have accommodation. Like, I mean, obviously I haven't played a full schedule and, and stuff like that, but I mean, I don't think there's much complaints with the hotels and stuff like that. The biggest issue I want to say on the, on the higher circuit is, you know, traveling and like flights because you still have to deal with that. Yeah. Like when I've been around. I actually think like, there's, you know, there's travel schedules more brutal than ours. Like in, in the futures and challenges, at least they try to do like these. Yeah. Like you don't have to travel that much in between. But at the ATPs, you're all over the place, I feel like. But that's where I mean, that's where I feel like it's, it's crazy to me that let's say you have American Airlines. So like you have the U.S. swing. And everybody that's playing, you know, I don't know exactly what order they're in, but like Indian Wells, they're going to go play Miami, right? They're going to go maybe play those tournaments in between. Like, you know exactly what everybody's planning to do that week. Yeah. And I think it's also like beneficial for tournaments to keep the players around during the weeks. So like the people that lose mid through Indian Wells, that you keep them there the whole week to like maybe practice and stuff because there's still such a value to get from that. And then maybe they can just organize. So like, all right, on the day of the semis, they'll organize a flight you know, to Miami for all the players so they can make it their yeah, optional like, free flight, know, yeah. just something like that. Maybe they need two, three different flights, like for everybody to get there for qualities or main draw or whatever, but still like, I just for sure feel like there's a way to, to schedule that yeah. easy. You can market it and do something with it. And yeah. yeah. I mean like maybe you, you can even get like a private jet, you know, if you're going to have like a hundred people flying, you can probably, if you make a like good deal with the team, I, like, I mean like with the, I don't know, like Bombardier or something like that. If you just have like a good deal, like it's great marketing for them. So it's like a win-win for everybody. You need to write some emails to the ATP, bro. You've been thinking about this for a well, while. I, I could make something happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but uh, also one last, like the biggest thing I want to yeah. say though, that they, they need to standardize balls. Yeah. Like, so it's the I same agree. ball, like all hardcore tournaments is like Wilson US Open. Like, you know, all the clay court tournaments, this, maybe green clay different, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But like the fact, you know, you go play 
in Tunisia, you play with Babla team balls that pop every two games, and then you go play another tournament, it's a Dunlop balls, and then you go pen, and like, no, it's like, yeah. That's one thing people don't realize, like in tennis, the everything changes every time. Like even from day to day, we could be like, for example, here yesterday was windy and cold. Yeah. And now it's windy and not that cold. Maybe the wind stops a little bit. Yeah. You play on a different court. Like I feel like the court I played on today was slower than what I've been practicing on the last three days. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you go from country to country, tournament to tournament. Everything is different. The temperature is different. The wind, the court speed. Um. So they need to. Tr- I agree. Like if as much as possible to try and make it as similar as possible like i'm sure at the slams maybe there must be a way like because these atp tournaments have to resurface all the stuff so i'm sure yeah. there's a way for like just remove some variables yeah remove some of the variables so and then that also that will help with injuries so people would get yeah. less injured less and then also probably would raise the level of the tournament because yeah. you don't have as much time adjusting to different conditions and different surfaces and speeds and stuff like if you keep the balls the same it's yeah. that's just one more thing you don't have to worry about I mean, also from a business perspective, I feel like there's so much that they're missing out on that it's just a win-win for everybody. Like, let's say that you're ITF, right? So you own all the rights for all the future tournament. If you just partner up with like PlexiPave and you have like a standardized, like this is the official ITF courts. In order to have a tournament, you have to have these courts. So then obviously like it's super valuable for PlexiPave because then all of a sudden all these clubs that want to have tournaments have to have PlexiPave courts. Mm-hmm. So then they just make a deal, you know, like, are you guys become the official supplier of ITF tournaments and we get, you know, yeah. money, for, you know, like you have to pay to become our mm-hmm. sponsor or something like that. So it's like a win-win for everybody. And the same thing with balls too, you know, you just strike a deal with them. Like, are you a US Open, like Wilson US Open, you're in charge of the whole circuit. I'm like the balls, not that I know what the business is like, but the balls is, to me, it seems like the most, the easiest fix, like, yeah. you know, like for the ITF or ATP, whoever to try to, because I don't know, there's been more and more people discussing like different injuries, like shoulder injuries and elbow injuries. Like yeah. I've been having elbow injuries, like elbow issues for the last like a year and a half. Yeah. I don't think it's from the balls, but what if it is, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's like you say with the variables, like that's for sure some variables that's, I, th- I feel like is an easy fix. Obviously there's more behind it than yeah. needs to go through, but just, I don't know, just the fact that they just can't have a, like a standardized ball. True. It was crazy to me. <laughs> uh, last question from Jonathan is, is Yannick Sinner's ball the heaviest ball that you've ever faced? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I want to say Robin Soderling. Okay. His ball is crazy heavy. Like when you, cause he, like, like Sinner's ball is, is heavy, but it's like a different way it can have it cause it has more spin. So it kind of like comes up a little bit more. But like when I play with Robin Soderling, his ball just like penetrates like crazy. I can send you a clip that we can put on the podcast. Like you <laughs> okay. got a showcase. I mean, it's like, it, it's a joke because he hits like hits through the ball. Yeah. Like insane, both forward and back inside. You get to train with a lot of these people when they come to the, the Swedish tournaments? Uh, he's like, I know him a little bit. He used to sponsor me. Uh, with clothes and, and different things so like we've been in a little touch he doesn't play much tennis nowadays unfortunately but yeah he was very nice like during a period we would play a decent amount and like he was giving me some tips and tricks and stuff yeah. like that so i had an opportunity to play with him uh which was awesome i actually have some videos on youtube that you guys might have seen if you I think actually I watch my stuff <laughs> actually I'm, two I'm a, videos i'm a fan now bro i'm, I'm subscribed <laughs> with a login what do you call your fans the subscribers what do you call them Fruits. <laughs> You don't have them like what's Taylor Swift on the Swifties? You don't have like yeah. a thing. The Pancake Club. The Pancake Club? That's actually a thing. Yeah. yeah. No way. You get the merch right now. Is it out? Yeah. Let's plug. We can put the the link in the description. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah, fine. I gotta go home and like do it. <laughs> 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 no, I mean I have it up there, but I've only made like joke merch. You have two. Oh, you showed me. Yeah, showed me. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's up there. Yeah. Do you wanna buy it? <laughs> Well, hopefully uh, we get some views in this video. You can go and support um, support Simon and also support us. We have merch as well. And we have the Pro Stringer also. If you want to buy a Pro Stringer, for those of you who, if this is your first episode, we have $100 off um, the Pro Stringer. We use it on the road. Do you, you don't use the Pro Stringer, right? No, but I've been meaning to, like, been meaning to get one. 
like I, I've seen a lot of guys using it. Yeah, seems yeah. to work code, great. Code changeover. Code changeover in the shop. You, you want to get you're one? You're welcome. I might. I might have to. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, so yeah, Simon, we won't keep you for too much longer. Thank you for for having us. Is there anything else? Thank sorry, you thank for you having for us. us. No, 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 Bro, worry. it's been a... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's been a day. Taking over the podcast. <laughs> no, it's been a day. Sorry. <laughs> thank you for coming it's on. It's yours now. It's yeah. my house. It's been a day. Sorry. Um, yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, Simon, we appreciate it. And but before we leave, though, we haven't talked about how was your day? How'd you guys do? <laughs> <laughs> Only because because he won and we lost. Why he wants to talk about the day, bro? My company's about to die. Uh, today, <laughs> today was a day, man. I lost today. Uh, no. Set four one down. Four zero back. down. You're four zero down. Was I? Yeah, you came back to four all. Five four. Know? It was 4-0. Yeah, it was two breaks down. That's true. Wow. Set 4-0 down. And got, back, got up to 5-4. Yeah, lost the tie break 7-4. But I felt like... I felt like I, I found like good level in the end of the match. And that's kind of how I would like to be playing going forward. So... Started to something. You were getting chopped in the beginning. Though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was not playing great. But um, <laughs> turned around there, so... Take the positives and go on to the next one. That's true. My day was brutal, bro. <laughs> Played very well, actually, for like a set and a half. And then, yeah, I just didn't close it out that well. Got to match. Well, I got to a set in 5-3. I started at 5-3, didn't close it out that well. Um, we ended up going to a second set tie break. Had a couple of match points. Um, they hit an ace on one. Very good all wide serve on the ad side against Josh. And then I had... A match point me serving. Um, the ad court player returned very well. So the plan was for me to go wide. He Josh crosses. He returns cross very well. But um, yeah, it was just a very tough return. Josh kind of scrambled, made two or three re reflex volleys. I didn't really know. I didn't know if to come in or to stay back. So I was kind of in no man's land. And they came to me. I missed the forehand. So that was all two match points. And then. Yeah, just a little bit stressful in the third. After you have match points and you lose a set and then you go to a 10-point tie break, the, you <laughs> feel like it's against you, you know? So like, I yeah. felt like it was an uphill battle. Um, About momentum. Yeah, the momentum is huge in doubles. Like I actually, sure. I personally feel that we lost the momentum at 5-2 us. Oh, yeah. um, the guy went second serve to my forehand kind of slow. And I feel like that was an opportunity for me to like be aggressive. I missed it like way long. And... But the mood was very light at that moment because you missed it way long, like fence, like way long, like like almost over the fence, clean off the racket. How is this man running the podcast right now? What do you mean? Like he's making us talk about the day. And this yeah, and no, that. It's, just, it's just fucking therapy. But um, yeah, we can talk about that actually. That's actually how I felt was that he hit the second serve to my forehand. I should have punished him, and the momentum keeps going. But now he has another life. He gets away with it. Now he's serving. 15 love, down 2-5, they squeak out a hole and they force us to serve it out and we don't, you know, like that's, I feel like that's where we kind of gave them a second life and then the third set, it's just a third set, like, that's all those things go, so, try that, not to beat myself up about it, what are you going to say? That's all she wrote. That's all the man wants to me. <laughs> no, he's, no, he's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, Simon, for no, real, thank good. you, we appreciate uh, you coming on, um, good luck for the rest of the week, hopefully you take care of the... Uh, the album, man. Let's play some doubles, huh? I'm ready for it. Let's play some doubles. Whenever you are. Let's go. Gotta run it back. Let's go. All right. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. See you guys next week.